So the recording is in progress. All right, let's start. So how can agriculture contribute to the green transition in the European Union? Today, agriculture accounts for 11% of the greenhouse gas emissions in the European Union, and 70% of those comes directly from livestock agriculture. Tonight, we invited our three experts from Belgium, Denmark, and Croatia to give their view on how the agriculture sector can contribute to a greener European Union. We explore how the EU policy translates into practice and which innovative uh, techniques are applied in those EU countries. Our national experts will share their vision of a sustainable future for farmers and provide us with some examples of good practices or pioneering projects to inspire us all. First, we will start with our expert from Denmark. We invited Jürgen, who is a professor and head of department, department of agroecology at the University of Argus. His research focuses on the adaption of agriculture production systems to climate change and emission of greenhouse gases from agriculture. Jürgen, the floor is yours. If you want to add something to your introduction, you can, of course, but I will give you about 10 minutes for your presentation. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I, I'll, I'll leave uh, all of the introduction to you, uh, but, but maybe just uh, say uh, a bit about uh, where am I? Uh, because uh, uh, our uh, research, even though it's the uh, Aarhus University, we are not located in the city of Aarhus. Uh, we have research centers in the countryside, one at Viborg and another at Flagebjerg. Uh, and I'm, yeah, and they're, they're quite distant apart uh, if, if you take the small country of, of Denmark. So uh, <clears throat> we have research uh, ongoing uh, at both uh, sites and and quite a lot of that is, uh, of course, related to uh, how we can address some of these sustainability challenges. I, I think it's important to note that in agriculture, we are faced not only with looking at how we are mitigating climate change. I know this is a hot political uh, issue, but there's so many other issues that we also need to deal with. Uh, and uh, for which uh, also agriculture uh, is is the main uh, factor that we uh, that we need to work with in order to deal with those and and some of those are biodiversity uh, it's pesticides and pesticide residues and and so on uh, it's uh, land use uh, and the many uh, consequences they have it's also nutrient leakages uh, to aquatic ecosystems and elsewhere and at the same time, of course, we need to recognize that there is an, in, an increasing demand for food. So that's projected to increase by 45% by 2050, not in Europe, but globally, and, and we are part of the world. Um, and at the same time, uh, phasing out fossil fuels increases the demand for bioenergy and biomaterials. So there's both a greatly increasing demand, and at the same time, it also needs to lower the uh, impact of agriculture. Um, I, was, uh, I was involved in leading uh, the development of a roadmap for research and innovation and implementation that could lead to, uh, to by yeah, 2030 and 2050 of dealing with uh, many of those issues. So we, had, we looked at four different components, land use, plant-based food, animal-based food, and biotech-based uh, food and of course also the governance schemes around this. Um, we even drew a map uh, of how uh, uh, elegant this uh, sort of uh, food system uh, is, and, and you can see it's really very complex. <laughs> so this is, this is basically part of the problem, uh, that, that when, we, when we look at the interaction uh, basically between our land use and management, that, that's where we have not many of those impacts I mentioned, and then the consumer to the right, all of the in-between, um, of course, is essential also. And it's also essential what we consume and, and so forth. Um, so we were looking into the many different managements and technologies and so on that needs to be developed and 
uh, come into place in order to deal with this. And I'll give some examples of all of this, but it's also important to note, of course, that uh, the entire governance part of this, and, and that's of course also when we talk about the Green Deal and uh, uh, even the current agricultural policy, and so that is a bit part of it, but it's only a small part of it. There's so many drivers uh, in this that also needs to be understood uh, and uh, where you need to be, build incentive schemes in, in order to have a transformation. Uh, but let's take a few examples. Uh, mitigating methane from livestock is important. Uh, if we look at methane emissions from agriculture in Denmark, it's about a third uh, of all emissions that come from there. There's another third that comes from our cultivation of peatland soils uh, and about a quarter that comes from nitrous oxide emissions. I'm not going to deal with the uh, peatland soils, but let's just talk about the uh, methane from ruminant livestock. Um, we, we know and we've known for some time that feeding those with uh, or managing the feed composition uh, can have a small impact, uh, but it's, it's really the development of additives uh, and including Bovea uh, that's now been marketed uh, uh, that, uh, that delivers more substantial emissions reductions. Unfortunately, by now we only have one compound, a Bovea, which actually means there's no competition, so it becomes too expensive, right? Because there is no competition in that market. So we need to develop others uh, that are equally effective so that we get a competitive uh, market. Breeding, we're looking into. Uh, also in the Danish context, we believe that could reduce by 10%. And over time, of course, that comes more or less free. It comes without any cost because breeding we do anyway. Um, and then there's the possibility of collecting or re removing methane and you'd see to the right there, uh, this is an invention by a company called Selp. Uh, it's a mask you would put on the cattle, right? So when the cattle burps methane, <laughs> a propeller starts and sucks in the burp uh, goes into the collar, into the neck of that cattle, where it's all burned at 400 degrees Celsius. Um, we don't know if it works, um, but, but it just shows that there are many different innovations uh, coming, uh, potentially also to be tested and so on. Uh, another source uh, is manure and manure methane. Um, uh, we've, we've been looking quite a lot uh, in Denmark into methane and meth uh, or manure or manure management over time. Uh, and biogas is a very much developing industry in Denmark, so that's part of it. But it's also um, managing the entire flow chain uh, of manure is extremely important so that you reduce any chance that you have of the microorganisms producing methane. Uh, methane is produced under anaerobic conditions without oxygen, but you also need the right uh, microorganisms and the environment for it. So it's managing basically microorganisms and their environment that we're working with. Uh, there is a potential here, here really, if, if we look into this, of reducing those emissions by 80 to 90%. We already know most of the technologies. So it's more the implementation side here, I would say. Um, another thing that we've been looking into, uh, and this is based uh, on a meta-analysis we did, so one of my, our postdocs uh, looked into the available literature globally, so this is more than a thousand uh, published uh, papers, scientific papers, looking into what actually works and what doesn't work. So when it says a negative value here, that, that technology would reduce nitrous oxide emissions. Nitrous oxide is produced in the soil, again, by microorganisms, typically uh, when we apply fertilizers or manure or uh, crop residues or what have we. It is interesting that if we look at what works uh, here, what reduces emissions, it's mostly the technology-based solutions that does that. Uh, if we look to the right at those that have less effect or where we even have increased emissions, those are some of those that we could call agroecological approaches or so on and managing maybe some of them even uh, used in um, regenerative agriculture and so on, uh, they actually increase emissions. It's not to say that we shouldn't be using those, but we need maybe to combine with some of the technology uh, solutions here in order to be effective. 
Another thing that's been considered quite a lot is can we increase soil carbon uh, storage? Um, uh, we're getting to the conclusion that uh, the only really effective things we have are probably perennial crops, grasslands maybe, uh, and the use of biochar, which is pyrolyzed uh, uh, biomasses uh, that uh, only is very slowly uh, degraded in the soil by the microorganisms. Because if we look at the graphs to the right, these are some of our long-term experiments, for instance, the one to the lower right, uh, where we've looked at um, uh, application of straw, different rates of straw over a 30-year uh, 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 period, yeah, almost 40 years. Um, what you'd see here that initially you do get an effect of adding more or less straw, but over time, that's basically when 10, 15 years, you approach a new equilibrium where there is no additional effect uh, on storing uh, carbon here. So we need measures that over time um, uh, store more carbon and, and that's uh, most likely uh, perennial crops and biochar. Another thing that's extremely important is circularity. Uh, and that's also been addressed, of course, with uh, uh, the bio, uh, bioeconomy and so on. But having a circularity uh, in terms of using the biomass here, uh, preferably for many different purposes, because we all both have needs for food, but also for biomaterials and energy and so on is extremely important and also integrating that with the crop production. So we are very much also looking into the concept of biorefining and so on, where we make diff many different uses of the biomass that we have. Um, so we think this is part of the solution, certainly both for uh, feeding more people on a given amount of land, but also reducing emissions from the entire system. So technologies are essential uh, for this. I've just mentioned some of them here. And again, you'd see we need to look at the entire chain from the land use here at the bottom uh, through the agricultural bean management uh, with the industry. And then of course, uh, also looking at um, the consumption uh, of the, for the consumer. I've listed, I won't go through all of those technologies. There's some here, there's probably more, uh, but I would just like to stress that technologies are really, in my view, the key here, and we need to work on those. Um, but there, there are more to it, because we also need to, to develop the incentive schemes for farmers and industry and so on to go in, in the right direction. Um, so that does acquire improved and accurate accounting of emissions all the way through from farmers, uh, through the uh, food system and, uh, and uh, at national level. Uh, and that needs a data-driven uh, agri-food system, in my view. Uh, and the regulations incentives should, should also work with this. And to de develop this, of course, there's a need for vast investments. We've uh, estimated what we think is needed in Denmark, and that is much more than what is currently available to meet these challenges in proper time. So um, we've, uh, we've, uh, we've formed this uh, innovation partnership in Denmark uh, called AgriFuture. It's got most of many uh, of the uh, major uh, food companies and also agro-industrial companies and so on, also some of the global ones uh, in, involved. Uh, it's based on a roadmap that I was uh, also partly leading uh, with 300 researchers across universities and innovation centers involved in developing. That roadmap is available as a white paper on the AgriFuture website, uh, if you're interested. <laughs> I, I, I think if you're really interested and, 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 and want to go uh, into it, it, there's a lot of uh, detail there. I should say uh, that this uh, roadmap has had uh, extremely, I think, high impact. Uh, it's, it's been, uh, some of it's been read uh, even by members of parliament. So it has influenced also the uh, funding uh, for this research and innovation in Denmark. I'll close in. All right, thank you very much. Um, now we will move on to our speaker from Belgium. Before we do that, I would also like to say that if you have any questions for our experts, you can write them down. Please do not put them in the group chat because that can distract the speakers because it pops up and then um, it might disturb the presentation. But after the presentations, we will take time to 
answer all your questions and then you can still put them in the group chat and then my colleague Sana will read them to the experts. But first, let's move on to our next expert from Belgium, Kurt Sannen. He has a master in agriculture engineering and he has work experience in NGOs as well as in the government and his own business. His career now is focused on the rural development and sustainability. And now the last several years, he has also been working at both the international and local communities. And now his job mainly is concerned with sustainable agriculture and biodiversity. Kurt, for you the same, if you want to add anything to that, please feel free. I will give the floor to you. Thank you. So to be short, I'm a farmer and I'm a researcher and I'm doing this from an agro, uh, ecological perspective, um, looking ways for how can we feed the world in equilibrium with our planet? Because that's the question about the green transition. Uh, it's not only about one single issue, not only greenhouse gases, not only about nitrogen, it's not only about biodiversity, it's not only about food security, it's not only about um, the inequality in the world, it's about everything together. And then you need answers which can um, answer all these questions in the same time. And that's difficult. We are not used as scientists and uh, in policy thinking in a systemic and in an holistic way. And that's the main challenge is how can we think and talk uh, and research about agriculture, taking all these uh, important questions together, uh, bringing them together in, in the same time. The last few hundred years, we had a big change. I think everybody knows that um, 100 years ago, my grandfather in this farm was milking his cows with his hands. He had four cows, uh, some pigs and a horse, which doing the the big um, work on the field and the rest he did with his own hands and agriculture stayed like that for the last three four thousand years if, if you would compare my grandfather's farm with a farm from the medieval ages it wouldn't be that different i think those people after two days they could talk to each other and they could work together on the field but if i now would um, ask my grandfather come to my farm and to work here, I think even after a few years, he doesn't know what to do and how to do. So we had a big change. The good thing is here in Europe, we don't have so much hunger anymore. The bad news is there still is hunger in the world. And we also have a lot of people who eat too much. And this food system and the rest of our industry and our households and our uh, everything we do as humans on this planet, we have changed our planet in a dramatic way, in, a, in such a dramatic way that scientists now say we don't live in the whole thing anymore. It's the age started, the era which started 10,000 years ago after the last ice age when man became um, a farmer, uh, before that he was uh, a hunter and a gatherer, but in that era he became a farmer. But now, now since 100 years, 50 years, we live in the Anthropocene, the era where the world, the planet is dominated by us, by humans. And we're doing it in a dramatically way. Um, I think and I hope everybody knows Rockström and Stefan, with a very, very important work uh, on the planetary boundaries. They have made a nice drawing, a circle, showing our planet. And then they've determined 10 uh, planetary boundaries, which determine the equilibrium of our planet. And if we go beyond, yeah, then we will change our planet, planet forever. And everybody knows now climate change is bad. And if you put it on a circle, you would see it's like that saying bad, 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 don't do it. 
change this. But there are other planetary boundaries which we are doing even more better. For instance, biodiversity change. Then I have to stand on my chair to show higher than the ceiling of my room saying how bad we are changing the planetary boundaries of biodiversity. And if we're talking about uh, nutrient systems on the world, the nutrient cycle on the world, you know what plant needs is um, nitrogen and phosphorus, the nutrients. Well, we've changed that equilibrium on this planet. Then I have to go on the room of my children upstairs to show how hard we have uh, changed the planetary boundaries on that and how far we go beyond what is okay for us. So we have a lot of challenges and these challenges are not just something um, um, small. No, these challenges are on a planetary scale and they are very, very important. So I'm very happy we in, in Europe, we have now the Green Deal saying that we have to work on this and that there's some kind of, yeah, political um, will to work on this. And in this Green Deal, we will see the farm to fork strategy, which I think is the right, some kind of the right direction, saying less nutrient losses, saying more biodiversity in agricultural land, saying more organic agriculture, saying um, less pesticide use, less use of antibiotics, and so on. Very good indicators saying which is the direction agriculture should go to, because I think that is clear. The agriculture of the future is an agriculture which produces enough, I think not more, enough per hectare, which produces with less pesticides, which can produce without too much less uh, externalities to uh, use, uh, like, like um, chemical fertilizer or um, antibiotics and so, and with less impact or better, no impact or a positive impact on our planet, on our ecosystems. So how can we do this? Well, the cause of this, these problems in agriculture is the choices we made in the 50s and the 60s with Siko Mansfeld, and he was a great leader, but he made very important choices saying, we need more technology, more specialization, um, more production, um, less farmers, and so on. And that's, that's what happened. And the European Commission, which is common agriculture policy, um, made this happen. The future of agriculture is that on the same pathway we have developed in the 50s. A lot of people will say, yes, yes, we need to produce more, and we need more technology, and we need more uh, production per hectare, and then, then we will feed the world. And I think that's the wrong direction. If you know on the, that you're on the road and you're riding too fast and you're causing too much accidents, the answer is not, okay, let's drive more, even more faster. Now, now then you have to think about, shouldn't we take another way? And I think there is a lot of, scientific research about that, how this would look like. And I, I, I will refer, I think, um, the, the work of, of, of Rockström and his colleagues about the planetary boundary uh, is a little bit continued by the EAT Lancet Commission. And they have looked to how should look a diet of all people and they changed it from hey, Europe is different than in Asia and in Africa and so on. How should that diet look like if we want to eat in a way that we can stay be, uh, inside the planetary boundaries? And the conclusion is quite clear and obvious. More vegetables, more fruit, less meat. I'm a meat farmer, so it's uh, yeah. nice to, say, to hear it from a meat farmer. Um, less meat, less potatoes and more leguminoses like bees and beans like that. And then you will see how would our agricultural landscape change? Less livestock, more um, plant-based production, 
That's the simple answer. And of course, circularity, closing circles. And I think the organic sector, agroecology, is a nice um, set of way of thinking and talking about agriculture, which can point out the right direction for the future of agriculture. So I don't think that we need more production per hectare in Europe. We need more production per hectare in Africa, in South America, there where the people need the food. We need less production in Europe because Every liter of milk we produce here in Europe, every kilo of pork meat we produce here in Europe produces hunger. It's not feeding. Because these animals eat soy from all over the world, from Brazil, from North America, and is using land there, is creating a lot of troubles and problems there, is creating hunger there, is creating nutrient losses over there, is creating biodiversity loss in those other countries. So we need to produce better in Europe, uh, not more. And technology maybe can help, but I think most important is that we need to change our mind about how we think and look and talk about agriculture. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. A completely other perspective than we heard before from the Danish experts. Um, very interesting. Good. Thank you very much. We will um, move on to our last expert from Croatia, which is um, Vladimir. Vladimir is a associate professor at Faculty of Ag Agro by Biotechnical, well, what a word, sciences in Osijek. And he's a member of the Department for Animal Production and Biotechnology. There he teaches at the pig breeding and biological and zootechnical principles in pig breeding models. So, Vladimir, I'm giving the floor to you. If you, yes, I see you can share your screen if you want. Kurt, meanwhile, I'm going to switch off your microphone, if that's okay. okay. All right, Vladimir. Thank you. We can see your presentation. Okay. Uh, hello to everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to participate in this discussion about the green transition. Sorry, I had problems with connection uh, a few minutes ago, and uh, I didn't hear a lot of uh, lecture of my colleagues from Belgium, but uh, the last words are very impressive for me. So uh, what is agriculture in the future, in my opinion, is that the main role of uh, agriculture is to produce food for the population also, uh, and that this will be her main role in the future. However, in the recent decades, we have witnessed that food production has become a race of quantity, not taking into account its impact on, first of all, the health on the population and then on the environment. Uh, in this way, we destroyed or both to the point of destruction, the main resource for agricultural production, which is clean and fertile soil. Therefore, the goal of agriculture in the future, in my uh, opinion, just a second, I had some problems with share. I can see my presentation. Yes, we can see your presentation also, but it's. I think you still need to switch on the... Mm -hmm. Sorry presentation modes because we are seeing the first slides first slide also i hear i see it but and the other slides we see at the left but not 
large enough. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. Yes, maybe you can stop sharing the screen and try again and then. Um, again. Okay. Yes, no problem. Stop share. Okay. All right, let's try again. Let's try again. Okay. So, okay. All right, we can now see the second slide. All right. Okay. Uh, so, uh, the role of the agriculture in the future, in my opinion, is to improve and uh, improve the fertility and structure of agricultural land so that we can produce sustainably in the future. I think uh, we don't take enough account of how much influence food has on our health. And this was the most visible during the COVID pandemic, when immunity was one of the main factors in the stronger or weaker manifestation of symptoms, symptoms of this disease. And we know that immunity is acquired in, to the greatest extent through proper and high quality nutrition. So what we and our children need to eat today will have a great impact on our health and theirs and will put a greater or lesser burden on the health and pension systems. So therefore, the issue of food is also a sociological health and economic issue for future generation. I think that in the future, we have to produce less, but with better quality. And we also have to eat less and with a better quality. These are the guidelines and goals that the agriculture on the future must strive for. Also, we must be aware that the consumption of meat and thus the production of animals will decrease, at least such are the trends. So we must not ignore the influence of public opinion, which is very critical on today's methods of agricultural production. So that it is is also one of the challenges that are put before the creators of agrarian policies. However, however, any future agriculture development strategy must aim to restore the main resource, the soil, and preserve biodiversity. The green transition represents exactly that idea. So we can say that agriculture will be to fly out the entire green transition in Europe. Of course, the development of sophisticated technologies and the application of accumulated knowledge will help us to overcome all the challenges. That Sorry, such... Vladimir, we are not hearing you that well. Um, can you maybe check the mic? Please. So, what is. Sorry. 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 No problem. I also very bad hearing you. Now, do you hear me better? No, I think the connection is not um, that good. Um, but maybe you can switch your um, camera off. And then I, I hope the connection with the sound will be better. Um, and then we can hear you, and then we can still see the presentation. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. All right. Can you maybe switch your camera off and try to Use only the microphone and share the presentation. Okay, I think we have no, some. Yes, sorry. So, sorry. Yes. 
No problem. I think we have some um, problems with the connection with Vladimir. Um, Vladimir, if you don't mind, I'm sorry, I think you uh, must try to go out the Zoom meeting and then go back in and then maybe we can later on um, try again with the presentation. Maybe we can then move on to some questions from the public. So we heard our Danish expert, our Belgian expert, and a little bit of our Croatian expert. Maybe we can hear him later on, let's see. But now he seems to have disappeared. Um, I heard already a lot of similarities. I heard um, the experts from Croatia as well as Belgium saying like, okay, we need to produce less, we need to eat healthier and so on. And then um, technology, we can see how we use it. And then actually in the presentation of Denmark, we saw a lot of examples on how we can um, use technology in a good way to enhance the agriculture, how it can help the green transition in the European Union and help to reduce the emissions of greenhouse gas. Um, does some of you have some questions for our experts? The floor is yours. If you want to say something, you can or raise your hand and then I will give you the floor or you can also use the tool on Zoom. It's called reactions and then you can give you can see like raise your hands, I will show it like this, and then we can see small hands and then I can give you the floor. Or if you would prefer, you can just put your question in the chat and I will read your question for you. But yeah. Jürgen already really is. Jürgen, you have a question? No, I have a comment. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and this follows on what Kurt uh, mentioned uh, about the, um, the Rockstorm, um, planetary boundaries and the Eat Lancet Commission, uh, because there were actually, uh, if, if you go into the background of the Eat Lancet Commission, they made quite some analysis and scenario analysis of how could you, could we feed the world in a more sustainable way that would meet some of those uh, planetary boundaries in a better way. Uh, so what they actually came up with uh, was saying, because they looked at what could be do done with dietary change, reducing waste, food waste and all sorts of waste, uh, and then technologies. Essentially what they showed was that none of these individual parts uh, actually is sufficient. You need to do all of them, right? Uh, which, which honestly makes things more, uh, I think more easy <laughs> because it shows <laughs> that we don't have a choice. Uh, we need to change everything. Uh, including the way we eat, uh, uh, making the maximum out of what we have, and then have the technologies uh, that produce in a sustainable way as well. All right, thank you for this extra information on this research. Are there any questions? Please do not feel hesitant. Our experts are waiting for your questions. You can ask them here or you can put them in the group chats if you want. Philip, I see you have a question. You have the floor. Yes, yeah, the microphone is uh, it's yeah. on its way. Perfect. You hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay, I have no question. I did a little experiment myself this afternoon. And the experiment I did, because this is a subject I'm not very well uh, familiar with. My experiment was I asked our dear friend, Mr. Chet GPT, uh, the, the agricultural sector can contrib contribute to a greener Europe in what ways? And our friend Chet GPT came up with 10 ways. So maybe I, um, I connect with Jürgen, his uh, last comment. He said, we should, we should not do this or that. Uh, same with Kurt, we should do it all. And I just, uh, I have a little uh, a document here. It is um, 10, 10 items. 
but I go over the items. I do not do the explanation because it's not my it's not my uh, subject, as I told you. But just listen this: sustainable farming practices. I think we heard this. Precision ag agriculture, reduced livestock emissions, uh, reforestation and afforestation, sustainable livestock management, organic farming, circular e economy renewable energy, reduced food waste, and policy and regulations, a lot of things to do. So these are 10 items, and I think we heard a lot of them during the process. So I think that this is in a very easy and simple way uh, explained that we should do it all. That is the only comment I have, and we are not the only one who knows this. The uh, chat GPT also knows, so maybe we are watched. Thank you, Philip. Also, thank you for all your preparation work and uh, <laughs> thank you for sharing this with us. Jürgen, I see you have, you want to uh, react on this? And yes, then after uh, Jürgen, I'll uh, give it, the word it, to Janis. No, yes, exactly. No, it, it, it is not, it's not, it's not difficult to come up with these lists. Uh, it, the difficulty uh, and what is really difficult is to make things happen in reality at scale. Yes, I also heard you say during your presentation, I think when it's when you talked about the agri future, agri future, I think it was uh, like that, um, that more money is needed also from the Commission. Do you think the Commission needs to invest more on agriculture and less on other topics within the Green Deal, like in industry or energy? Should we take more focus on agriculture or what do you think about that? I, I, I think there is a need not only for agriculture, but looking at the entire food system, because it's not only at the agricultural part, it's the entire food system, including consumers and so on, that needs to be part of the picture. And I'm a bit worried, actually, if, if you look in to this only as an agricultural production issue, that won't solve it. Uh, we, we, need to, we need to have the entire food chain involved, including all of those intermediaries, because sometimes we forget about the importance of retailers and processors and all of this, um, so that if we only have the focus on the farmers, we're not going to solve this. Thank you. Janis, you have a question also. Yes, uh, good evening. Thank you for organizing this interesting debate. Um, when while listening to these uh, both speakers and, and, and the conclusion that we have to change it all. Um, and also in the comment of Jürgen, or no, of Kurt, um, it was shown that it was it is possible to change it all because we already changed our food, food and our agriculture system in a dramatic way uh, the last hundred years, but change comes always with um, resistance to change. And I think we see this in Belgium now with all the debate on the nitrogen um, surplus that we have in Belgium and measures we should, and the measures that uh, the government is taking to address this. So my question is, um, yeah, how can we uh, have uh, farmers and consumers as allies in this change instead of now uh, what we see now um, that they oppose this change? Thank you very much for your question. Kurt, maybe you can answer? Yeah, that's, that is the question. And uh, so I don't have the answer. I'm, I'm trying to think about how we can talk about the answers to this question. Um, and one part is, of course, the contribution of the farmers. But like Jürgen says, if we want to change something in agriculture, if we want a green transition, then we need to look to all the agri-food sector all over. And I think it indeed it is kind of inspiration going back to the time of Mansfeld and seeing how did he do it? How did he change our agri-food system in such a dramatically way? And can we learn from that? 
And then I'm becoming quite pessimistic because one thing I've learned from, if you read all the history books is uh, simple. Follow the money is always the answer about what will happen in the, two, in the future. So what will happen in the future is how can a small people who have the power now, how can they become more powerful and more rich? And if your ideas are fitting in that, then this will be the future. And if not, it won't help. So why did Mansold's uh, plan work? Because a lot of farmers had changed a lot, but they didn't have power, they didn't have money, and they had to do the change. Who were the winners of plan Mansold? Well, people we know now, the big companies in the agri-food sector, they are winners. And you see it now, we have in the agri-food sector and in other sectors also, we have big monopoly players on the whole world. I'm now saying Cargill, John Deere, Unilever, Nestle, Schwartz, um, and some other uh, companies, Bayer, uh, BISF. What I have said now, these seven companies I've named, well, these people, these companies, they have more than 50% of the markets in all the agri-food sector, what we produce, how we produce, what products we use, where we sell it, what we buy, and so on. These companies decide what will happen. So maybe we need more than just a common agriculture policy. We need yeah, a strong um, economical change about how do we deal with food? Is food just something um we we create in, in in a neoliberal free market and it's produced where it's produced the cheapest and it's sold where the people are um want to pay a lot for it or is food a human right and do we need to um think and work about food as a human right and yes i'm sure in this debate the farmers i'm a farmer so yes we are um, allies in this, but you see that that a lot of farmers are opposing against these changes, and um, it's very difficult to 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 make make it happen on, on the field because the uh, power of all those companies in the agri food sector is so much, and they don't want a big change. They want to keep the money and keep the power in their hands. So. How do we change this? That's a big question. I don't know. Still a lot of big questions to solve tonight. Um, we also have a question of Ulrik in the chat. You can read with me if you want. Um, he asked, given the amount of agriculture products needed in the future, would a consumption tax on meat at the consumer level not make more sense than adding one at the production level? on top of a general pollution tax, hereby economically double penalizing the entire industry for not having reformed previously at the time where they are making great strides to actually do so. Jürgen, I feel like you can solve this question. No, 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 no. But, but this is certainly, you know, uh, some years back, I was member of the ethical council in Denmark um, <laughs> that those that deals with medical issues around ethics and so on but also with food related uh, issues so one of the uh, topics we uh, considered was exactly this so how could we from a consumption perspective uh, look at changes uh, in our behavior and so on and, and some of what was actually proposed back then this is maybe like yeah, it's more than five years ago, uh, I remember. We had a hearing in parliament on this, also with a proposal for a tax on meat. And I, I vividly remember this because every, everybody, everyone from all political parties strongly opposed this, right, back then. Now it's coming up again. So now, now it's actually more in, into the picture. The problem though is we don't know if it will work or not. Uh, and that, that that's a, it's a bit about what when we talk about you know, these incentives and incentive structures and so on we have too little evidence of what actually works uh, and uh, i'm i'm personally from a, a research 
science-based, where we would like to work with evidence-based things. And I think we need the, on, on those incentive schemes and so on to have more ev evidence on actually what works and not uh, be, and in particular be, but I think we, we do need incentives both from the consumer and the production side and so on. And it's not just one thing we need. We also need some incentives for those intermediaries, right? Because when I go into the supermarket, um, I don't see much incentives in the supermarket for actually transition uh, from less meat to, <laughs> to, to, to more vegetables and so on. Uh, so I, I think you could work on this in many different ways. There's not only one way, um, but, but I think it's maybe part of it. I don't know. Gurta, so are you nodding no when uh, Jürgen said that it would not work, the tax on meat? Um, <laughs> tell us. Well, I strongly believe in true cost accounting mm -hmm. uh, because that's very important. If, if we want to change something in the world, we need to change the economy. Uh, it's the economy stupid, said Bill Clinton to uh, Bush, and he won the elections and he became president. So, and, and that is true. So we need to have a focus on economy. And is there only, well, I think the, 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 the uh, way of true cost accounting is important, but we need, need to do it very conscious and, and think about what do we want to reach with this. I don't believe too much in consumption taxes because on that, I don't want to punish the consumer. I want to change the way we produce. And um, if we want people to eat less meat, then we better should put taxes on nitrogen, the cost of fertilizer, and the cost of soy, of the import of um, feed from all over the world to have our animals here. Eh? Why do we have in Denmark and Flanders so much animals, too much animals, that's, that's obvious that we have too much animals, because we have the ports nearby and the import of feed is so cheap, so we have so many pigs, so many poultry, so many cows. So we need to have an equilibrium again of these animals with uh, the land. And I think one of the best ways of the real cost is the import of nitrogen, put tax on that. And then the cost of animal production will rise. Of course, automatically the uh, cost of meat will rise in the supermarket, but you force the um, producer to change their system using less external inputs and working more in a circular way because that's what we want. We want farmers to be circular because with only a meat tax, you also punish me. I'm producing meat. I produce it in a circular way. Uh, I don't use any externalities on my farm. I'm completely circular. But you don't make with a meat tax a difference between, between good cows and bad cows. And there are bad cows and there are good cows. Good cows in equilibrium with um, the ecosystems around them. Bad cows with no equilibrium with the ecosystem around it. And we need more good cows and less bad cows. All right, Jürgen, I'm going to give you the floor to react on Kurt, and then we move on to the questions of Heidi, and then we need to let's check, then we need to end the debate. But first, Jürgen. Well, the, 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 the part of the problem here is that we've got these free markets for food, which actually means that if we put constraint on some consumption, uh, certain countries or, or parts where you get those higher uh, costs of, of production, <laughs> then they, they become less uh, competitive. Uh, and I think that is a real issue that we also need to be concerned with here, which is why I think maybe a combination of what we do on the production side with also some incentives on the consumption side, plus also something in between that would ease a transition for many consumers towards having an easier transition towards less meat, more vegetables. I like to think of more vegetables and that 
less meat would follow, actually. All right. I'm, I'm very interested in, it, in this debate, but I'm also super biased. My parents are butchers. So um, let's move on to the question of Hedy. Um, will the CAP, the common agriculture policy, be phased out? Otherwise, we do not have a green deal and thereby a sustainable and resilient agriculture. Kurt or Jürgen, what do you think about that one? The last one, and then we need to end this debate, sadly. Kurt, maybe. Yes. I hope the cap won't be phased out, but I hope cap will change very hard. What is cap now? I'm a farmer. You give me money. That's it. Okay, there is some uh, things I need to do before I get that money, but it's money which keeps me in the way a farmer is now. It is not changing agriculture. So cap should change dramatically. No hectare. Uh, subsidies anymore. No, um, I mean, no first pillar payments like we have now. Uh, what we need is to change the system in public money for public goods. Reward farmers who produce more ecosystems than needed, who produce biodiversity, who purify water, who um, take care of the landscape, who um, make our ecosystems work around us, pay them for this and give them a real good income with that. But don't use CAP for further um, growth and, 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 and specialization of agriculture, but use it to change agriculture in a real green transition. And then, then CAP would be a very good instrument, which it isn't now. Thank you so much. And now some final words from Jürgen. No, I, I would agree with that. Uh, I, I mean, we, we, we do need it, it. It's been a fault uh, anyway uh, with the with the current uh, cap because that has just uh, caused an increase in land prices. So basically, the the, the current uh, payment schemes has been capitalized into greater land prices, uh, which then also becomes a barrier maybe also for, for younger, more innovative uh, farmers uh, to go in. So we, we do need a change. The, the question is, of course, how to make that change and how gradual it needs to be, because there are also farmers that do uh, are dependent on what we have. But it would be a really good idea to have a plan for this, right? Uh, so that you can see where are things going and where will this end. However, uh, I would be relatively skeptical that this would ever happen. All right. Thank you so much for your input for this very interesting debate. Um, we need to end this online debate very sadly. I thought it was very interesting. Thank you so much, um, Kurt, for joining us. Thank you so much, Jürgen. Thank you so much, Vladimir, if you're still somewhere out there. Um, if you want to um, follow us on Facebook, uh, our three organizations, Europa Huis, DEO, or Crossel, there you can find some more interesting debates or activities that we do. Or we also have a common website, bedemocracy.eu. Um, Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us tonight. And maybe see you later on some other events. See you later. Bye. Good evening, everybody.